I'm happy that you all um, taken the time out of your life to come today. Um, and uh, you're welcome to ask questions as we go along. Uh, I was asked to do this talk. I gave a talk for the um, Circle of Friends. What was it about? Two years ago, yeah. maybe maybe longer. Yeah. But um, this was the first opportunity that you know, we managed to make it work out. Uh, I moved to Myrtle Beach a year and a half ago, and I can say I love living here. I can't imagine that it took me so long. I lived for 42 years in one week in Naples, Florida. So this was quite a change. Anyhow, so we begin. The talk, Mayor Baba and Astrology. And another talk I gave information on how I you know, came to do astrology, but I wanted to just to present some information of what this field of study has meant for me in terms of my relationship with Baba. And uh, if you want to know why I've stayed with it so long, you'll have to ask him. I don't have a clue. <laughs> he asked me to do it, and so I'm doing it. Anyway, I came to Myrtle Beach on my first pilgrimage here from Chicago in 1972. I had been with Baba for a year, uh, for two years at the time, which if you remember when you first came to Baba, the first two years are like a century, so much happens in a very compressed period of time. So it was, it was massive. I felt like I'd been with them for lifetimes, had been, you know, so much had happened. And so I'm getting a tour around the center. Um, Jim Myers was giving me the tour. And, you know, we were about halfway through and he turns to me and he says, Bob, do you know the difference between a new Bible lover and an old Bible lover? And I said, <laughs> no. And he says, well, a new Bible lover wants God realization. An old Bible lover just wants a day off. <laughs> I thought, yep, that pretty much describes it. I felt like, yeah, we're, we're all settled in for the long haul. And I don't think that anybody comes to be a Bible lover expecting instantaneous enlightenment. Although I did, you know. <laughs> Actually, we all did, probably. <laughs> But at one, some point, we do just want a day off. It's like we're just been, we feel like we've been worked to the bone. And uh, it's, it's sort of like an initiation into a fraternity or sorority or something. It's like you can't, does this ever end? But uh, the answer is, of course, it does. And, and if we get there, I'll be sure to let you know. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, Bob chose this line of work for me and so I, over, over the last half a century I've seen clients that's been my uh, livelihood and Bob has worked with me in various ways but putting this talk together made me stop and reflect what did I get out of this you know Bob what did you get out of it why are we doing this I'm not designed for astrology you know it's like my I'm I'm more you know just uh, like just focus on you and forget all the science forget all of the math forget all of the other stuff well as I, I'm repeating myself for those of you who were at the talk a couple of years ago but I was taken to an astrologer by um, my Indian history professor in college and Swami Kriyananda took my chart and said all bunch of things that were all true and good and he says and, and you know, one of your co-workers is talking behind your back and if you get angry you will lose your job if you stay calm which was not my style but <laughs> if you do that 
and you will not only keep your job, but this coworker who is really, you know, like conspiring against you will lose hers. And so I thought, okay. So I thought, I've always been a take charge, angry type of guy when, when controversy comes up. But I thought, I'll, I'll give this a try. And sure enough, um, when everything exploded, I was harmless. I, I kept my job, she lost her job, which was kind of important because I, I needed the job because it was for the university and it was giving me a tuition waiver. So I thought, okay, I went back to see Swami Kriyananda with some other issues and he, he said, you know, Bob, I've been doing astrology for a long time. I'm seeing something in your chart that I've only seen three times before you will become a professional astrologer. And I thought, wow, he really went off the deep end on this, because everything he said to me was true, except this is nuts. You know, it's like, I knew astrologers, and they walked around with armloads of books, predicting all kinds of stuff that never happened, and it was like, it just seemed nuts to me. Um, the only professional astrologers I knew in Chicago was a witch and a Hindu <laughs> Swami, and I thought, that doesn't really fit my idea of what I want, but you know, Baba brought me to the profession as, as it turned out. But as years went on, looking back, I realized, um, years went on meeting, actually when I was preparing this talk, it dawned on me <laughs> that, that, what, that what Baba was doing was organizing my thought process. And this gigantic frame of reference which seems like um, Buckminster Fuller's repairman for the entire universe it's like why would I care about this you know I don't care how creative I mean it's like I read God Speaks only because Baba wrote it that it was that that was it it didn't it didn't interest me the mechanics of the universe were in some other dimension you know it's like that's for you remember how it was when you were in college and there and you'd go to um, a party and all of the people who were in the computer world would be talking in a foreign language gathered around in a circle and you couldn't make heads or tails of it and then in another corner there were the people who did astrology and they were talking in a foreign language it didn't make any sense it was like why would this frame of reference be important for me? I couldn't figure it out. But looking back on it, I realized that I wasn't a very tolerant person. You know, I had written lots of people off as like other, and astrology allowed me to understand a vast uh, array of different personality types just from the simple typing that astrology brings. And I, I'm very grateful to Baba for uh, ramming it down my throat. You know, it, was, it was literally, it, it was one of those things, I've never been a, much of a halfway person. You know, it's like I was either doing something or not doing it. And from the day I started doing astrology, I, I did it completely with, and every day since then. Um, and, and now, looking back on it, I realize, well, yes, it did give me this inner sense of being less judging of other people and more accepting, which in some senses made me kinder, more um, able to get along uh, under a lot of different circumstances. And I had good astrology teachers, too. Um, when, you know, there were a bunch of people were like doing very difficult, bad things in astrology organizations. Uh, Doris Hibble, one of my uh, first uh, astrology teachers, said to me, Bob, you're criticizing this guy, but he doesn't have a strong Saturn in his chart. Just recognize he's not disciplined. And so, yes, he does these things that you don't like. Um, and those things kept ringing inside of me and I realized okay 
all of what astrology has done for me has brought me closer to Baba by breaking down a lot of barriers mm. and, and, and recognizing, okay, uh, I became a better citizen of the world, better citizen of the country, better human being uh, amongst the people here because I had um, the, this frame of reference. So I'm, I've been very, I've been very grateful about that. I'm, and, and it took me a long time to feel grateful. Trust me, this wasn't the you know one and done type of thing, because I struggled with it, not just to always do good astrology, but in, uh, uh, you're mo everybody here is in pretty much in my generation. Everybody here knew Kitty Davy. Well. Kitty Davy was the only human being that I had this relationship with. When she spoke, I took it as directly from Baba and always did exactly what she told me to do, regardless of how off it might seem. Like, she told me that one day she was looking at her calendar, she says, there's somebody that you have to meet and you have to go to the library and, you know, They'll, they're going to tell you, you know, something that's important. Well, I'm looking down and she's looking at a calendar from last year. And she's <laughs> telling me to go to the library. And I know that the library's closed. <laughs> but being gets kitty, I just went to the library. And I sat down next to a Bible lover that some of you might know, or a guy named Ron Dillman, who I haven't seen in, in years, but he was there and he told me this a most amazing um, story about Bob appearing to him. And it was like, oh, it was like I realized that Kitty directed me to see him. So I'm doing astrology and in meditation um, one night, uh, when I came to Baba, of course, I was always thinking about him and doing what, you know, had a conversation with him and stuff. But I always had this time at night before bed. Uh, would, I would just sit and, and, and be with Baba. It was in conversation with him. And he would tell me various things and stuff. It was all, I, nothing profound but it was all just part of our relationship. But one night he said to me, take your parents to Myrtle Beach. I thought, okay, how am I gonna do this? You know, my, my parents are both Christian ministers. My dad read all of Baba's books as soon as I became a Baba lover. And well, he's an Aquarius, a very open-minded guy. It was, e it was easy, uh, and my mother being, uh, Capricorn from the South, you know, was always in a very, you know, you know, rigid formulation about what should happen. But because Baba made it possible, I ended up bringing my parents to Myrtle Beach, along with my aunt and, you know, um, a couple of my siblings. So we're here and I'm meeting Kitty, you know, with them, and they're having a great conversation and uh, mom and dad both loved Kitty, of course. Everybody does. I never met anybody who didn't like her, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> so we're leaving, and Kitty said to me, Bob, what are you doing to keep the wolf away from the door? I said, well, I do astrology. And she says, oh, I don't like the sound of that. And, and dad said, well, you know, it doesn't keep the wolf very far away from the door, but, but it, 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 that's what he does. And so my, my parents, I got them back and they left and, and I went immediately to the phone. I called Kitty and I said, look, I want to come and talk to you. She says, okay. So I got to her house at noon. We sat in her office there, just the two of us, until five o'clock. and. You know, Kitty had, in, people, you know, tell Kittyisms, you know, little 
stories about how she would get things wrong and stuff. And, you know, I have my own index of those. But Kitty had a, she was a Virgo, and she had a very analytic mind. And when she would, when she would focus on something and actually take it apart in real time, she could be miraculous. And after that, and taking a short break, and bringing Margaret Krask in, and Margaret talking to me for about an hour, and Kitty and Margaret um, both told me the same thing, which was, uh, and, and Kitty extracted a promise from me on this. She said, um, this has to always be just between you and Bob. You can't, I mean, I was asking Kitty, I said, if I went to the said, look at if you don't like doing this, I, it's done, it's finished. And, but after hours of taking things apart, she said, you have to always know from Baba directly that he wants you to do this. And don't ever let anybody intercede in that link. Which, um, and, <laughs> <laughs> and she got very specific too. She says, and that means Mercia. Don't let Ivy Deuce get between you and Baba over this. Where that came from, I don't have any idea, but it, it became useful because in years later, Ivy and I became very close over astrology, and she would criticize me, but also send people to see me professionally. So anyway, it was just one of those things. And so I was in India uh, back about, um, oh God, I should have looked this up. You know, I, I've taken 60 pilgrimages to India and I kept a diary with each one. But it was on one of these pilgrimages to India, um, Bao, uh came and said, Bob, I want you to spend the day with me. This is like it early in the morning at, uh, at Mirabad. I said, okay. And so the whole day we spent together. I went to the tomb and, you know, like, and, and Baba would say, go back and be with, with Bao. So Bao and I spent, and, and he's meeting all these Indians and he's talking in Hindi most of the day, which I don't speak. But at the end of the day, he gave a talk and at the old Pilgrim Center and everybody's left and I and we embrace and we're standing around in a circle and and people are leaving and I thought I should leave I you know I already embraced Bao but I was just standing there and everybody else left and Bao came up and got in my face and he says what will you do when you go back to the United States and I says well I think I I think I might take up the study of Hindi uh, because, you know, I want to read Baba's biography and the original and, you know, it's all and on. He says, no, it's for another lifetime, don't do that. And, and then he got very serious. He got right up into my face and said, do not let anything get between you and the study of astrology. It's your path to Baba. And it's like, I knew that, but I never said it, and I would never have put that out in, in that way. Um, I'm always uh, circumspect on things that happen between me and one of the Mandali or other things that, you know, that, are, that are part of following Baba. But uh, Baba's done a number of things like that. Um, to push the button, to keep instilling in me that regardless of whether I do it poorly or whether I do it excellent, I'm doing it for him and I'm doing the best that I know how to do. <laughs> so, uh, on another trip to India, I hadn't planned on putting all of this in here, but this is coming. Uh, Erico, who you know, all, probably everybody here has had some time with Erico, um, 
uh, and he and I were, were really good friends. I guess everybody was a good friend to Erico, but we spent time together all, when I would be on pilgrimage pretty much every day. And he says, I'm going to give Mo a bath. I want you to come and uh, participate with me. So Muhammad, the mosque, just gets bathed by Erico, you know. So I'm there and we're, Muhammad's in, in, jubilant and he's just going on and on and I'm, I'm washing him and, 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 and Erico's going and fetching bucket after bucket and, and Muhammad is going over and over and over. He's saying this phrase in Hindi or Marathi or, you know, some foreign language. And Erico comes back in and says, Bob, you have to get this in writing and get him to sign it. He's saying, why? What's he saying? He's saying, you're a great astrologer. I'm thinking, I'm a great astrologer, but maybe I'm not very good at giving him a bath is what the <laughs> subtext is here. <laughs> but, um, you know, Baba does these little things every so often to try to reinforce, like stay at it and, and stay uh, doing it. So, what, you know, again, uh, the whole concept of astrology came to me in a flash. I mean, the night I became an astrologer, it was like the whole frame of reference came in one big enchilada. And I understood it for whatever it was, but I still took classes and I still read books and, you know, did all of this, you know, studied with teachers and all of the stuff that you do when you're, when you're learning a field for, for real. Even though Baba had given it to me all in one shot. And on my first trip to India, I asked Mani about that. I said, how can that be? You know, it's like astrology is very complicated. How could it come in a flash like that? And she says, ah, oh, this is something I actually did get to ask Baba. I says, really? He says, yeah, because I went to Dad, meaning Baba's father, and said, you know, um, how come you can speak Hebrew and it's only, you're the only person in Pune that speaks Hebrew other than the rabbi? And he says, oh, it just occurred to me. And, <laughs> and, and I thought, oh, okay, because that's what Dad said. But then when I was in high school and I was studying French, I realized, a foreign language doesn't just come in a flash. <laughs> so I went to Baba and I says, how is it possible? Dad told me this. And, and, and Baba said to Mani, that is what Dad told you was true. Everything that you learn is already inside of you. And you can learn in two ways. One is it can be accreted from the outside. And the other is, the veil can be lifted, the curtains can open, and it can just come out. Uh, and that was, that was how he learned Hebrew. It just did come to him in a flash like that. And, and Mani says, that is apparently, well, she said, that's what happened to you. She was declarative on it. Said, okay, so I take it as, you know, Baba, Again, I'm, um, I have a lot of fixed planets in my chart. Fixed is stubborn. It's, like it, it's good for being solid on something. But it's not malleable. I mean, it's like it's, it's there and it takes sometimes a lot of bumps to, to get through to you. And so Baba keeps uh, pushing me on this. So. I have a, a lot of, you know, like uh, things in my history that I've come into contact with. I've seen astrologers do miraculous things, things that I don't do. Um, and I remember talking to Arnavas in India about uh, the work I was doing with astrology, and she told me that uh, she had gone to see this great astrologer with Chanji's chart when he was very sick. And given the astrologer, um, Chanji's uh, birth time, 
He calculated it when I walked in the room. He threw the chart at me and says, what do you take me for, a fool? This man is dead. And, you know, it's like I left because I was, you know, intimidated. And I told it to Baba, and Baba says, the astrologer was right. He was supposed to die. Um, but for my work, I pulled him back three times from the death's doorstep because I needed him for my work. But that's, but, but I can't do it any, I mean, he didn't say, it says, what do you want me to do? And, uh, and that was just before Chanji passed away, apparently. I, I had a, because I came to Baba, I was in prison. Um, and, you know, I didn't know any other Baba lovers, and so Baba talked to me, and we had a r running conversation about everything, and I didn't know that that wasn't every other Baba lover's way of being with Baba. Um, but he literally saved my life so many times. He was like, I'd be walking, he'd say, no, no, turn left. And then, you know, like right behind me, there'd be a fight break out and somebody got killed. And any number of times, you know, it's like just pulling the string like that. And Baba, when, when Bailey, my daughter Bailey, by, by the way, Bailey is here and, and uh, Deborah, both of them helped me put this uh, talk together and I'm very appreciative for their assistance. But um, right after Bailey was born, Baba said to me, now, you know, you have this new child and you're in a happy marriage, everything's fine. Why don't, uh, would you like it to have your life extended? And I was, karmically, I was supposed to die at 53. I'm 76 for the record right now. But I said, Baba, if you want me to stick around, I will, of course. <laughs> but if you're asking me for me, no way. <laughs> I just want to get the job done and get out. You know, it's like, let me do what I have to do and be done. And Baba would, you know, you know, Baba just kept bringing it up and bringing it up and bringing it up. And I was in India with this woman. I had just gotten home from India and this woman uh, Penny Woolworth had called me up and asked where I'd been. I said I was in India and she says, what were you doing in India? I says, I'm a follower of Mayor Baba. I went there to, to be at his tomb. And she says, is there a woman that lives next to his tomb? And I says, yeah. I says, um, oh, who is that? I says, well, her name is Mansari. And she says, oh, Mansari, what a beautiful name. I think she holds the key to what I'm supposed to do with my life. Will you take me to meet her? And I says, okay. He says, well, when can we leave? I says, I just got home. It's like, you know, I, I can make arrangements, we can go next month. He says, I have to wait a whole month. I mean, that was how motivated she was. So I took her to India, and I'm just leaving Mansari's um, doorstep, you know, walking out, and Bob has spoken, says, I've just changed your karma. Now you'll live to be an old man. So uh, I keep thinking every year, am I old yet? <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's, 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 not that, it's not that I'm so in, yeah, it is, I'm in a hurry to die. I'd be happy to just be done with this lifetime. But more than that, I want to please Baba. And if it pleases him for me to stay around for a while, uh, of course I will, you know, I'm happy and uh, to do whatever makes him happy. So what did I learn from uh, doing astrology and being with Baba? First of all, going back to the start, even though I was like an automaton, doing astrology automatically, night and day, I mean, I would, I would come home from school I would sit in my tiny apartment with no furniture. I had an altar and a you know, picture of Baba and sit in front of the altar uh, all night. And then go up back to school. And then I started doing astrology and I'd calculate charts all night. And I was just, I, it was compulsive. 
I could not stop. Even when I was down at Myrtle Beach, staying on the Baba Center, I would take a plate and put it down on a piece of paper and draw a chart and then from memory get people's birth information and start putting the planets in just because I had memorized enough of the ephemeris that I could, could uh, reconstruct things. And at some point, uh, you know, I just accepted, okay, this is, you know, this is now, this is what's, what's happening. But uh, in retrospect, I kept saying, why do you need astrology? You have Baba. You know, you ju to just love Baba. Baba said over and over again, don't try to understand me, just love me. Don't worship me, just love me. And I'm okay, so uh, the expression of my love for Baba is doing astrology. Uh, that's because that's what he's given me to do. And even though I do not understand why, it pleases him and that's totally enough for me. Anyway, um, I remember being with Adi K. Rani in India in his office and there was a Hindu. This is, you, do you remember what it was like going in to register at the trust office in Ahmednagar before they went? It was like, it was a ritual and we all went in to, and we would hang out and Adi would give a talk once a week and you know, it was the early days. Um, so there was this, uh, I mean, a lot of funny things happen. Like this guy comes in who doesn't, uh, he's kind of, he lives in Ahmednagar, knows a little bit about Baba, you know, but not much. And he said he wanted a picture of Baba. And remember those, those big poster things that were printed on newsprint that Adi used to have hanging in his office and you could purchase them for like a, you know, 25 paisa or something. And this guy said, I, I want a picture of Mayor Baba. And Adi says, um, well, I have lots of pictures. What, what picture did you want? And he says, the one that says, do worry, be sorry. <laughs> and Adi laughed, he says, well, sir, I tell you, if you do worry, you will be sorry. <laughs> But you, you realize that the milieu ar around Baba activities at the time, Baba wasn't, what would you say, well known amongst the population there, except for the people who were Baba lovers. And this guy said to Adi, well, God's everywhere. Why do we need Baba? And Adi says, sir, oxygen's everywhere, but how do you get it into your lungs? <laughs> it was like it stayed ringing in my ears when I started doing astrology. That, yeah, you know, the spiritual path is there. But the point is, how do you get on it? How do you tread it? How do you actually work, work the, the path? How do you get on board? And you can have any number of different frames of reference. You know, you can read the Bible and you know, like say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, you know, what it says in the Bible, or I'm gonna, you know, like, read the Quran and do what the Prophet Muhammad said, or I'm, I'm gonna, you know, follow the Buddhist precepts. Any of this stuff. What does astrology bring to the table? And being careful on this. On my first trip, January, February, March of uh, 1976, I went around and asked every living Mandali, what do you know that Baba said about astrology? Now at the time I had been doing astrology for three years. And uh, I got three quotes that came from a number of people, but they were the only, uh, this was a consensus. Everybody agreed on these three things. That Baba had said, astrology is the perfect science. Out of a million astrologers, one understands it. And the third thing is, is that astrology has to be interpreted 
in the culture in which it arises. So the first two things were dead bang easy. It's like, okay, you know, it's a perfect science. Okay, it has to be interpreted in the culture that it arises in. That was, that was hard, I, you know, one out of a million. Okay, I, I got it, Baba. I'm, I'm not the one in a million. I'm just a guy, you know, and I'm doing this the best that I can, but you have me here, so I'll do my best I can. But this, uh, you know, does it mean that I'm supposed to do Hindu astrology? And I thought, no. Astrology arises in every culture. It, it's like any, any civilization that you go to, if you get connected to the indigenous population, they always have some form of astrology. Always. Because how else would they know where to catch fish? How would they know where, you know, the, the, the best time to go hunting? How would they know whether there's gonna be a good harvest or bad harvest? It's like, it was there in every society. And, and so it's the single connecting thread intellectually between all of the world cultures but I live in this culture, you know, even though I've had a lot more lifetimes in India than I have in the United States, and I feel like an Indian soul trapped in a Western body. The truth of the matter is I'm part of this culture, and it was important for me to practice an astrology that was inherent in this particular culture. So, big turning point here. I started the organization for professional astrology and met astrologers all over the world and I was on the road about 20 to 25 days of the month seeing clients in person in various cities around the country and you know I'd always meet other astrologers and so I started the organization for professional astrology and got astrologers talking uh, with each other um, and you know, on and on, things kept developing. I had a correspondence school and, you know, clients everywhere and, you know, stayed on top of technology more or less. Uh, and then uh, I was just getting ready to publish the manuals that came with my correspondence school. I had already, you know, I, you know, I have the eye of like, what is needed? And there was a need for an organization for professional astrology because all of the astrology organizations, not just in the United States, but internationally, all of them are run by amateurs, which is fine, but there was no place for astrologers to get together and discuss all of the real life issues that confront them in their everyday life. You know, how do you charge people for your work? How do you plan your day? What's ethical? Uh, to do and it's like and on this issue which is one of the things that came up every organization at the time that I became an astrologer in 1973 you had to sign a document that said you would not predict death but right. I had clients in India that said that's ridiculous how do you plan your life if you don't know how, how much time you have <laughs> it's, it's like it's an entirely different perspective on life and death um, and, you know, when I first started doing astrology, there weren't a lot of astrologers that had in their mind, you know, reincarnation, um, karma, uh, all of the things that you, we all take for granted, being Baba followers. But it was natural for me. And so in 2004, Baba spoke, which he always does, said, um, I want you to write a book on how to use astrology to raise consciousness. And don't publish any other book until you've written this book. Well, I, it was seemed like unfathomable to me. How am I going to write? I don't have, number one, I do astrology and it's out here, but my spiritual path is private and I don't talk about it. As a matter of fact, on my first trip to India, Mani said to me, oh, this is great. Do you give Baba's name to your clients when they come to see you? I said, well, his picture's always there. If they ask about him, of course I give it 
Don't you so? Don't be so greedy. Give people Baba's name. So I did. And I always, ever since then, ever, ever since 1976, being with Monty, always give people Baba's name when they come for an appointment. And it gets worked in regardless, somehow. Anyhow, so I started writing this book and it allowed me to uh, organize my thoughts. Well, uh, what is astrology? It's easy to sort of toss it off as, uh, oh, this thing that, that people do that they don't do very well. Well, Baba said that one out of a million understands it. And uh, I did my best to try to learn from the best. Um, Baba did say that the great Rishi Bragu understood astrology perfectly. And when he was, in, and the great Rishi Bragu was almost 5,000 years ago, calculated charts into the future and just hypothetical charts of, of people who were going to be born. And those records exist in southern India and a number of places, Bangalore being one of them. And uh, a, uh, a Baba lover, when I was in India, uh, came to see me and while I was staying at, at the um, at the old PC, and he said, you know, that Bob had spoken to him and wanted him to come and talk to me. I said, okay. Now, this is a Bob lover that I did not know, and he is a Westerner, and he said, um, I was with you in your last lifetime, and he was, in fact, my lawyer in that last lifetime, and I was also a lawyer. So he brought all this stuff out, and I'm thinking, Where'd you get this? And he said, oh, from these records. Well, the great Rishi Bragu, when he read Baba's chart, went into Samadhi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he was apparently liberated while he was reading Baba's chart. Yes. And it is very, wow. it's very accurate and it's been, it was reproduced in, an, in, a, in one of the earlier Awakening magazines. So anyway, but my point is, astrology, is complicated and Baba just asked me to write this book and two things number one is I had to figure out how to get my arms around it and number two I knew that I had to reveal certain things about myself and my understanding of the spiritual path that I really didn't want to I was I have Scorpio rising in my chart I'm you know private person, even though I have Moon and Gemini and I can communicate all the time with people. So digging into it, I had to find some simple way of uh, determining what to say to people about how to use astrology. And I was lucky, or Baba presented himself to me in a way that made it seem like I was lucky. Uh, that um, I could, you know, from all of the complexities, astrology is really based on four basic principles. And when Baba asked me to write this book in 2004, I stopped being an eclectic astrologer, meaning I didn't, I discontinued studying all the other systems, I was, was numerous different. I know some of you might know uh, there's a Norwegian Baba lover who lives in India who practices a Burmese astrology <laughs> called a Mahabhota and um, it's you know again the systems that come out of every conceivable culture but there are four basic building blocks of astrology and I extracted them and if you could put that up for me I'll show you um, what they are. Thank you, Baba. Uh, there we go. Oh, cool. This is sick. 
PC persons. Oh, okay. Well, I can just tell you, there are four things here. You know, I gave these, I gave these slides to Deborah, and it's, um, it's, it's like you're going to have to scroll it a bit. Yep. The four building blocks, a sign of the zodiac is built on the Earth's revolution around the sun. Now, a circle, you know, Baba would gesture like circle of perfection when he was pleased with something. A circle brings closure. And the, the first uh, circle that we're really con concerned with is the um, annual cycle of the Earth around the sun, which gives us the, the zodiac. Then there's the second cycle, which is the Earth's rotation on its own axis that gives us our our day. So that's a that is gives us what's happening in the material world. The energetic pattern behind events is shown by the signs of the zodiac. The houses show you what happens and where. Without the without the Earth spinning on its axis, it creates. You can think of it as like a vortex that manifest something in time and space in specific places, which if you want to get down in the weeds, I'm happy to go into as much detail with this. The planets are creative forces. Now, this is something intricate that's, um, you know, I'm sure all of you ha have had this ex ex experience sometimes. When Baba gives you a task or says, here, would you like to do this or that? It's like, and, and you look at it and you think, well, if you make me a bank president, <laughs> then I might get well paid and get respect, but my mind will be all eaten up with details all day. But if you just let me sweep the floors at McDonald's, I can think about you all the time without any distraction. So the idea of wanting to be just concentrate on Bob all the time was a very big deal. So when I got down into the weeds with this book that he had given me to write, Bob says, don't forget your mother. And I, I think, oh, okay, well, my, my physical mother in this lifetime advocated and protected me against all odds all the time was a most amazing human being. Um, but Baba was reminding me, uh, when I first started doing astrology, I had been doing it a couple of years at the time. I, I might have it written down somewhere, but because I, I had diaries from that period, but I had a dream. And you know, uh, Baba says that certain dreams are extremely important, that you go back in, in a Jungian sense, it's a, a, an archetypical dream or a wellspring that you drink from. Well, in this dream, which I've shared with all of you who know me very well many times, uh, I dreamed that I was walking in a snowstorm with my mother. <laughs> and we didn't have anything. We were poor, we were hungry, we were cold, and we were without proper clothing or shelter. But she was holding my hand and I could feel this immense love that she had for me. And uh, as we walked along, at, at one moment I turned up and looked at her. And when I looked at her, she was astrology. And I realized that the Divine Mother was presenting herself to me as the uh, as the whole enchilada, as as Maya, as astrology, the, the creation. And to back up uh, a number of years, um, as I matured as an astrologer, you know, at night when I would meditate, every so often this overwhelming. Uh, feeling of for the Divine Mother would come to me. And 
I would just be uh, buried in her presence, and Baba would always get rid of that. I said, okay. And, said, and, and that always stayed with me as like, you don't look to anybody or anything else. When you're following me, that's it. Everything else is as if it didn't exist, it's nothing. Which had always been my way of being with Baba. Uh, but something changed. And Baba said, go back. Remember, your mother. And you need help with this book. And so I, it was, it, it, it is painful but to spend time with her, because she's very loving, but to get uh, the gifts that she has to give, it took a number of years of practice to be able to be comfortable with that. And then uh, there's a section of my book that will be, it's gonna come out, it'll be released on the 15th of February at this workshop that I'm doing in, in Florida. But there, you know, the, there's the sun and the moon, which are in the first part of the book. But then in the middle section of the book uh, is a chapter for each planet of the Venus and Mars and Saturn and Mercury and Jupiter. But Baba says, go ahead, talk to the planets. So I started into this inner dialogue with the planets. Now, for those people who aren't with Baba, it's easy to say, oh, you know, this is, um, this is some delusional thinking, or you're, it's a makeup thing that you're substituting. Um, that you're going through an analogous kind of conversation with a part of yourself. All of which is true, but it's not the whole story. And something that I have known, but didn't ever really talk about, is, is that there is a triangle between the planet and what's going on in your internal state and what happens in the external world. Meaning, Mars is a real entity. It is a deity that has a role to do the Martian thing in creation brings that distillate into manifestation. But it's also part of your own inner makeup. It's the empirical side of your nature that acts, that the researchers that collect data by experiencing it. And it is anger. And, it, and Mars is the thing the Baba says what are the big barriers on the spiritual path? Lust, anger, greed, all of the things that you find in your inner state. But Mars also rules the internal combustion in engine. Mars is fire. Mars burns. It's like, okay, and all of the things, that, all of the tremendous disruption that happens on the planet, all the wars and stuff, that is Mars in action. And this, we same thing, Venus, planet of love and beauty, uh, truth, um, is a literal deity. And that you can watch the movement by the movement of the planet that shares the name in your own life. And it is that internal state, that love that, that you feel, that, uh, that vision, the, the artistic vision that you have. Um, but it is also the external beauty in the material world. But, and so on with each one of the planets. And so uh, entering into a dialogue with each one of these planets, I was able to extract some things to share with people that um, aren't in any of the books, aren't, you know, this, it's like, astrologers are, we are all like the three blind men, attaching ourselves to the elephant, 
and saying, oh, the elephant is very like a snake, or the elephant is very like a tree, or an elephant is like a wall, depending on what part of the elephant we're connected with. And astrology is so vast. And you wonder um, how, to, how to keep it simple. I don't know. Anyway, so that was my big, my big step, was to break it down to these four building blocks. And the final one here is the aspects, the angle of separation between planets. And how, because they constantly are in motion, they have a relationship to each other. And you know, you've, you, you've talked to people, um, well, let's put it in, the, let's put it in, a, in terms, how, husband and wife, and you, you can't stand each other, we just, how do you stay married? Well, separate bedrooms. It's like, how do you, how do you get a, along with this friend of yours that you like so much? Well, we spend a lot of time together. So what I'm saying, there are these distinct personalities that planets have, and ha you have friends that say, oh, they bring out the best in me. I was like, I don't know why I said that. I'm not a nasty person, but they just irritate me so much. So the planets have different relationships with each other that are partly shown by their angle of separation. You know, they're somewhere in that 360 degree circle. So, um, oh, I don't know, just put up anything. <laughs> what is the next uh, thing here? Uh, we got the... Just a second. Uh, diagram signs. Yeah, diagram signs, okay. So, here's a, this is the simplest diagram of the zodiac I could find. If you look where it says the ascendant, where there's, oh, I got a little marker here in my pocket. And I, yeah, this is here, I got it right here. Yeah, right there, okay. So what the deal is, that is the vernal equinox. That is where the sun crosses over the plane of its motion. Um, and the sun rises there on approximately uh, the uh, 21st of uh, March when we enter spring. And then the sun, the days continue to get longer until we get down to the bottom of the chart where we end up with um, um, we end up with uh, when the sun enters Cancer, the longest day of the year, and that's uh, huh. this was working before. Now it's not. How about that, you guys? We just do this, Baba. Well, you know what? I tried. Okay. Okay. Anyhow, the point is, is that that's the longest day of the year, and then we go up here to the where it says descendant. That is when the sun crosses the ver, the um, autumnal equinox. Again, equal hours of daylight and, and darkness. If any of you want to do this, I, uh, you, right when the the moment within minutes of the time that it cro the sun crosses the vernal equinox or the autumnal equinox. You can take uh, an egg and balance it on its end. That's a reality. That I mean, I've actually done it a number of times just to prove to myself that it could be done. But you can also take a broomstick and stand it on its end, and it will stand for about 20 minutes uh, while there's that alignment um, between the forces of daylight and darkness. Anyway, I've always been a great experimenter with this, and now we, the, we've come to the point where the sun next month, at the 21st of December, approximately 21st of December, will go to the midhead. Will go to where the, we're at Sagittarius and uh, Capricorn meet. That was the shortest in the northern hemisphere. That's the shortest day of the year, <coughs> and the sun. Uh, Solstice literally means sun stands still. It's the place where the sun is changing direction. And those uh, markers uh, let you know that the seasons have changed. And we organize our life based on not just the seasons, but uh, on the 
24-hour rotation of the Earth on its axis, which gives us departments of life, which if you can move to the next the diagram here, yeah. I'll show you that um, okay. these are basically traditional um, placements. First house. Fourth house, seventh house, tenth house. What are these things? These are what are called the angles of the chart. And what does that mean? Well, the first house is you, yourself, your physical body, your name. What's the fourth house? It's the, literally the ground underneath your feet. It also symbolizes family, home, security. Um, um, mother, amongst other things, but then the seventh house, what is that? It's what's right in front of you. It's what you see, what's out there. Um, it's where you meet other people, but where you meet the environment, one-on-one -on -one relationships. And what's the tenth house? It's what's right over your head, the top. It's, it's like, oh, that's what you aspire for. That's your career. That is your your role in society is what you do. And again, there are 12 houses and they all have meaning, but what I'm just showing you is, is that the annual rotation sets up an energy field, the houses materialize them in the departments of life. And when an astrologer is looking at your chart and saying, oh, there's a problem in your um, home I I environment, you know, it's like you got Mars in Cancer that's getting a hard aspect. You better, Mars is in a water sign, you better check your plumbing. You know, there's a pro, in other words, astrologers go through things like, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm hard to believe, but I'm really very soft spoken now compared to what I was <laughs> 50 years ago when I first entered the field. I remember this guy coming to see me and you're saying, oh, I gotta switch jobs. And it's like, and I'm looking at all the actions in the seventh house. I'm saying, your job's fine, you hate your wife. <laughs> Let's deal with that. Said, you guys, say, oh, oh I, I don't know. It's, 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 but, but, you know, the thing is, is that, I mean, and astrologers often can go, and, and Swami Kriyananda used to say to me, this job is terrible, I tell people what's causing them pain, and they ignore it. I'm saying, oh, well, you know, it's like, it, it is rugged to be able to see what's causing a person to suffer. And it used to frustrate me. It doesn't anymore so much. Very often it doesn't. <laughs> I, ho I hope I'm getting somewhere with this, but, but the thing is, is that you can see now um, the larger context. The person is suffering and they can't get out of the box, but you can give them encouragement and knowing where to find the joy in their chart and help them get out of the difficulties, go toward the things. At least show them what they have to work on to get um, beyond uh, the difficulties. Um, so writing about um, the different meanings that the houses and the signs have spiritually it changes not just the meaning but it allows us to go to the root. What does this actually mean? You know, it's like the ground under your feet, the home, the family. Um, okay, um, but what's that about? It's your heritage, it's where you came from, it's the the belonging, it's um, how you identify with things that brought you here. And the same thing with, you know, your first house is your, your, your name, you know, what do they call you? You know, it's like you meet somebody at a party, what do you do? You ask them, oh, what's your name? Where do you live? Are you married? What do you do for a living? You know, the, the four things that everybody asks when they are meeting somebody for the first time. So,
but to explore um, the what's behind that uh, is to look at the um, the spiritual causes and like how do you get out you know how to go beyond this um, uh, you know I remember years ago listening to a bunch of Baba lovers talk at the meeting uh, um, house and and uh, somebody was talking about this and that and we got to serve Baba and this and, and I remember Erwin Luck saying to the person that he was conferring with he says well when did God realization go out of favor. I thought that's what we were all actually looking for. It's like, and the truth of the matter is, to be frank about it, we could all be asserting our, as Baba says, our divine birthright to ask for God realization. But most of us, most of the time, we easily get sidetracked. And it's like a, a Come here, let me give you this. No, nah, you don't need this. That, nah, forget that. Hey, just have a good time. That's, and, and we get satiated. We get talked out of the central focus, which the only thing that I know that creates the central focus is to stay 100% focused on Baba. I remember um, being with I, Ivy Deuce, and I were pretty close. And, uh, I mean, because we com conferred about a number of things. But uh, she was in Chicago giving a you know, couple of weeks, you know, a whole week she was there and we went out to lunch and she gave talks and people asked questions. And when the question came up, uh, somebody in the audience said, well, Mershida, how can we remember Baba's name when we are dropping our physical form. And Ivy said, I'm not going to take Baba's name when I die. I want to look around for a while. And I thought, oh, that makes it simple. I'm never going to be a Sufi. <laughs> it's like, that's for people who love the spiritual path more than God. I don't, for me, it's the central focus has to always be on Baba. But that was okay. You know, I mean, Baba created all these things. He created Hitler, he created, you know, like all of the things that we find distasteful, but they serve his purpose somehow. So, what I have uh, learned uh, is that if I, as long as I keep my central focus on Baba, uh, all these other little pieces fall into place and, and, and fine, it's good. Now, this talk would last several hours if I took the time with every drawing that I had placed here, but I'm going to see if I can jump the line here to what's um, the most important thing. Spavis was the most important thing. And it's, it's like, um... When is the few days long workshop? Well, yeah. I, it's February. Fed, well, there's a day long Florida. workshop in Florida. And you don't have to go to Florida. It will be streamed on. And I will just uh, say, I have a free newsletter that comes out every month. And I brought 10 copies of it printed out. and. Um, anybody who wants a copy, um, see this girl here sitting in the front, dressed in black. Um, that's my youngest daughter, Bailey, who is an amazing human being. I have to, t I, you know, every, every so often, somebody says something that actually stuns me. In the early days as an astrologer, I'd be sitting with a client and they'd be talking, and I would look at them and say, well, that's not so unusual. But inwardly, I've been going, you did what? Ah! It's disgusting. <laughs> it's like, it's like, 
but seldom do I really get caught flat-footed. <laughs> this woman called me up who wanted to know if I still lived in Naples, and I said, no, I'm, I'm uh, living uh, in Myrtle Beach. She says, oh, I lived in Myrtle Beach for a while, and I went to the Baba Center and so I said, oh, that's interesting. And she's telling me her name and I'm trying to place her because she had come to talks that I had given at my house when I lived in, in, um, in Naples. But she also had come to see me for appointments, which I got to tell you, up until about maybe 10, 15 years ago, I would have never have forgotten a person. Regardless of how few times they saw me, I would remember them and our appointment and every detail of their chart. Now it's all gone except for when I'm actually sitting in an appointment with the person. Then it's all, it get clarity of focus, but then it all disappears immediately afterwards. But anyway, so this woman's going on and I sort of remember her name, I think, Ah, uh, yes, I, I, get, I kind of remember we had some interactions. And she says, well, will you have um, a lot of uh, a children? I remember, you know, you had this daughter, Katie, and Bailey, and you had Hannah and Sylvan. And uh, I said, look, at, I'm enjoying our conversation, and I know that we both have very busy days. Was there a purpose that prompted you to call me? She says, well, yeah, would you adopt me? <laughs> I said, that's a showstopper. She says, why do you want me to adopt you? She says, well, all your kids seem to be doing so well. I thought, I thought maybe that would help. <laughs> this, this, this is a bridge too far. Anyhow, so as an astrologer, there's been many paths um, that I've walked down and I'm on a fairly straight and narrow path now just attempting simply to get done with whatever Baba wants me to get done before um, I'm ready for the undertaker. Um, I used to joke with Mansari, she says, oh, I see you have your passport, did you get your visa? which was her way of saying, can you die now? And we, we bantered this way until after she had her stroke. And I went to see her and she, she says, oh, Bob, I love you. I'm so happy you're here. You're, we, you're my old crow. I love being with, and so we talked and she says, well, what have you been doing? I says, oh, I'm like you. I'm just waiting for my visa. She says, I never say that. Every day in the physical form is a blessing. Mm. A, it was a complete 180 turnaround from the conversation that we had been having for so many years. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop and tell you. I've got a, I've got a mountain of technical material with slides, everything to show you, but I don't want to. Uh, uh, carry you off into the rabbit hole of obscurity here. So I'm, I'm going to just say, what, what are you interested in? What questions do you have? Yes, ma'am. I have two. Um, one that came to me was uh, the question I'm mulling over in my head. Baba discouraged Ivy from consulting um, astrologers and psychic, psychics and whatnot. And how did you resolve that within yourself? Um, could you diving in. You mentioned it, but I'm curious if that kind of came no, into that, that is extreme. You're, you're talking in a way that is extremely rational. And the conflict would be very rational. You know, Baba said this, and then the, this other thing is happening here. There's, and you know, Baba you know, you got to admit, Baba loved conflict at times. He set people up for it, you know. Yes. You'd get two people who had entirely different uh, perspectives on life, one of them being an artist that wanted a very delicate thing, and the other person doing this wild publicity. You get them together, wanted to do a magazine. 
<laughs> one magazine, two entirely different. I mean, these kinds of things, or having two Mondelez members that did not get along with each other have a room together. It's like, okay. But after my conversation with Kitty Davy, I never had a second conflict about it. Be because I knew directly from Baba that this is what he wanted me to do. And uh, it's also the kind of thing where uh, if you know that you have to do something and you know, Baba's telling you to do it and, and your focus is on him, even if you're wrong, if you're doing it 100% for him and you're giving it to him, there's a blessing in it. In, it's like, because your desire was to please him. Um, I, I, I've, never, I've never had a fascination with psychics or um, trying to extract um, invisible knowledge on something. And yet, I was in a career, one time I was, I had a job. It was like I'm paid to go do this as an astrologer at a psychic summer camp. And, 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 and this isn't, um, you know, Aunt Rosie's tea leaf reading room. These are, these are, these are serious people that are all over the map doing, they have worship services where they're reading messages from the church and the podium and stuff and they have seances and they, you know, people are talking to dead people and it's like, <laughs> so I'm in the seance and they're, uh, they're having their spiritual masters up here and it's like, really woo-woo stuff. I mean, and I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm, if I'm hired by a group to do something, I participate 100%. And so I'm there, and I'm in this thing, and people are coming out, and, and uh, they're saying this and that, and this and that, and I'm, and, and this psychic comes and he's, he stands, you know, in the front and he points to me and he says, this guy, uh, Mayor Baba, is speaking to me and he's telling me to not worry about something that I was concerned about. He says, you will go to India and he gave some time that I'm saying, and I say, and it'll all be a result. And I'm thinking, okay. And I'm thinking, uh, and so I, I leave the, I leave the church and, and I'm, thinking, oh, okay. And Baba speaks and says, what's the matter? Can I talk to a psychic if I want to? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> and so we're in a seance, a dark room. And there are, you know, people that have, you know, like Count Yorga or, you know, like Count Saint Germain and there are different people coming. And it's like, the energy's like really up. I mean, it's like your hair standing on the end and stuff. And they, they, the guy who's doing the seance is like in a trance, and he's calling me forward. And other people have these like vaporous things appear, like Tinkerbell and stuff. <laughs> it's like, and he calls me. And this guy takes on the physical appearance of Mayor Baba. He looked like Mayor Baba in the oh, physical yeah. form. And he comes, and I stood up, and I, I don't want to touch him. I put my hands behind, and he reaches, and he takes my hand, and he's saying, I want you to know that you're doing the best that you can. And he's talking. He's not like silent. He's like speaking, and he's, I'm thinking, okay, I, I can take anything, you know. So, so I walked out, and this other psychic said to me, uh, was that was pretty interesting. Was that, that was Mayor Baba? And I says, well, I know Mayor Baba's hands. 
and they actually did feel like his hands, but his fingers were too short. I know, his, I mean, it's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I mean, that was not Mayor Baba, but it did, damn, it looked like him. And, and the guy says that Mayor Baba could not appear the way he did for other people there. He had to imprint himself on this guy's physical form. So you are getting this rendering of it. And I'm thinking, I don't care one way or the other. I'm a follower of Mayor Baba. And this, you know, it's like my relationship with Baba is not based on this stuff. And people would say to me, oh, I was in, I was in a seance with these, these people. And they, they, you know, they, they talking to me and a bucket of water appears over me and pours on me and everybody's touching and saying, hey, it's really wet. He's, it's like, and I said to the psychic, I says, well, could you materialize a towel? No. <laughs> he says, oh, no, I haven't got that part down yet. <laughs> like, oh, okay. But I'm saying all that stuff is, you know, phenomena. You know, it's just stuff. And, but I realized after I left that, I was at the psychic summer camp for like a month or something, you know, it was like, and when I got, when I got back, I thought, well, all of those people that were there heard Baba's name, you know, so it was his way, maybe, I don't know, what can I, you know, I just know that, you know, he works through everything and everyone. So, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. It does very nicely. Okay. Uh, second part, if I may. No, go ahead. Um, is how does astrology and sanskaras superimpose, if at all? Does oh no, know? it's it's a very very uh, it's a very very important question. You had here's again. This is my understanding, and. You know, it's, it's been a lot of, you know, like knitting my eyebrows together and spilling ink over a lot of these ancillary questions. Mars rules the determining Sanskara in your chart that brought you back into incarnation. Use the mic. Oh, Mars is the determining Sanskara that brought you back into incarnation. And Yes, everything, everything under the sun, everything in creation is shown somehow in uh, the astrological chart. There's nothing that's excluded. Um, but, but Mars is your reason for incarnating. It is the, it's the get up and go. It's the energy that puts you into action. And uh, when you um, are are acting out, you create karma. So the sanskara, which is a mental impression, translating into action becomes karma. And once the karma is made, it does not dissipate. And uh, we end up in our chart with Saturn, the lord of karma, showing what it is that must be done in a lifetime. So Mars and Saturn, one makes the karma, the other is the harvest cycle. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big deal, you know. In the book, Nothing in the Everything, uh, Baba had given this to Bao, says that 30, uh, 30,000 Sanskaras make up one hydrogen atom. So there's a lot of Sanskaras involved in pretty much anything that we do. Okay. Uh, any, any, uh, I don't find any conflict, though, so if there's something I didn't ans answer, you can ask again. Yes. Um, I, do, you, do you look at um, astrology aspects that kind of control the mood of a time? And yes. if you do, what do you see happening now? Well, we're getting ready to go into a very, very uh, uplifting time period. And that what it will take to get there is um, dour. 
Yeah. Well, you know, Dower. Dower. you know, look at it. Well, if we manage to avoid the destruction of the United States and World War III, we've done a good thing. Or Bob has done a good thing. He's given us a break. Um, but with Pluto on the 19th of this month, November, went into Aquarius, the sign of the New Age push uh, energy for the first time in 248 uh, years. Uh, it was going back and forth, in and out of the sign between Capricorn and Aquarius, but that's one symbol. All, uh, could you, um, I'm going to run through these, this is, I'm going to run through these very quickly. If you could pull up uh, a few charts, uh, a few things here. Go to the personal planets. Okay. Yeah. Pull that up for just a second here and see if you can put it in a way that I can show them all at once. Yep. yep. These are the five planets that um, are everything that you experience in life. Everything comes through these five planets. The ego, the, the environment, um, um, duality, the experience of subject and object, Venus, the planet of love and beauty, and Mars, the planet of energy. These five planets, they're called the personal planets. Um, you move it down just a tiny bit. Yep. yep, there it is. And those five things, that is the entire context of what we, ex what we directly experience in life. Now, if you can go to the next one, which is the social planets. There are two planets that are called social, and they are um, Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter is the king of the gods, and it can all of the other planetary deities, as well as all of the angels, report to uh, Jupiter, which is Indra, that sits on the throne of the universe for as long as a hundred and four a thousand years. Um, some and sometimes, sometimes it get, he gets dethroned. Jupiter is not just a planet; it's a it's a station. It actually is a being that went through the human kingdom and now sits in that place. And in your individual horoscope, it is the organizing principle. It's the big administrator controls all the functioning. Now Saturn is the lord of karma. So Jupiter rules light and space. Saturn rules time and sound. And where, the, where they intersect, you can call it part of the space-time continuum. That is it place... Prana and Akash? Yes, it is the Prana and Akash. But where they... But, and, and, you know, it's like the grand scheme Prana and Akash, and I'm glad you brought that up, but everywhere they intersect, there is the existence of one soul, which is where what happens when Prana and Akash meet. And what Jupiter and Saturn do is they create the container for everything that happens in the culture. It's a 20 year cycle, and the opening cycle is 10 years of you know joy, and then 10 years of you know, return, and it's, it's open and ex Jupiter's expansive, Saturn is constrictive. And Jupiter, king of the gods, would philanderer that he is, would go on just replicating if there was no limit. Uh -huh. But so Saturn is the stopping point. It makes things come to a close. This is the container for the culture. Now, can, can you pull up the universal, uh, in, elemental and universal symbol here? I just want to show you something. The what? The, the, your, el, you had it there. Element, individual, universal, elemental, universal. Yep. What? Yeah, just about. But what this is, I'm just going to show you. These are the signs of the zodiac. Um, there you go. Okay, now the elemental signs. Aries, Taurus, Gemini, and Cancer. Baba said 
that at the beginning of creation, the four elements, fire, earth, air, and water, are the first things that are created. They're the four primary elements. And so the elemental, uh, Aries is a fire sign, Taurus is an earth sign, Gemini is the, uh, is the air sign, and Cancer is the water sign. These are the four building blocks of everything that exists in the material world. Now, Leo, Virgo, uh, Libra, and Scorpio are all, those four signs are the path of return. That's everything that happens in human life collectively as our civilization happens in Leo, Virgo, the, um, uh, Libra, and, and, and Scorpio. Okay, uh, and again, there's a wonderful book called The Zodiac Life Epitome. It was written in 1929. It's about this thick, and I used to read it every year. It's the mother load of the way that the zodiac operates. Now, the universal signs are um, uh, Sagittarius, uh, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces. Now, why that's important? Look at the, you see these planet placements? You know, the Mars, Venus, Mercury, Moon. Sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars. Then we got Jupiter, Saturn, Saturn, Jupiter. Well, those are the universal signs. The universe, they're, they're the laws. They're beyond our direct experience. They create the container. That is where what I was showing you, Indra's net of, you know, Prana and Akash meeting each other. That's those signs. Now, um, there was something that happened uh, when I was teaching a class on the Zodiac back in 1974. I stumbled on uh, Henry Van Stone's article in a 1910 magazine called um, uh, Modern Astrology, where he correlated the 12 Nadanas, or the cycle of dependent org origination, with the 12 signs of the zodiac, and they work. I won't carry you around it now, just because uh, it would take a, a long time. But at the time of his enlightenment, Buddha said there are four ways to obtain, in, there are the four noble truths, and there's the 12 Nadanas, which are the two ways of obtaining liberation. The four noble truths are, you know, life is suffering. Uh, your desires create suffering. When you extinguish uh, your desires, your suffering disappears. And then he said, there are, there's the eightfold path, the ways to get out of uh, your desires. And it's simple things, like it's the golden rule, it's like um, the Ten Commandments, it's like, you know, have right livelihood, right, in the right mindset, right, right attitude. It's like, I'm, again, it, it all boils down to that. Okay, so those, those are the, that's, that's the speedy way. The slower way, you might think, is the, what was called dependent origination, which is, you know, the, a cycle of causality. And the Buddha goes on in, in one of his discourses to say, the wheel of karma keeps spinning because of two things. And he, I'm, the, the word in English would be basically ignorance, which is Aries, and desire, which is Scorpio. So in your chart, if you look at the house that has Scorpio, and you look at the house that has Aries on the cusp, regardless of where your Mars is, this is the manifestation of where the difficulties come in this incarnation for you with your desire nature. Now, understanding doesn't carry you 
beyond it in our normal means of understanding. Ananda, who was the Buddha's chief disciple, said when the Buddha gave out dependent origination, he said, this is simple, it makes perfect sense, you know, your ignorance creates, you know, Aries creates, Taurus creates, Gemini creates, and so on around the wheel, I, without giving you the names, you know, it's another whole study. But the point that he was making is, is that if you want to break that wheel, you have to extinguish the, your ignorance and your desire of nature, but he didn't mean understanding it in a classic textbook way. It meant to understand that at a deep way, where you could actually live it out, um, that kind of um, deep knowledge is so different than academic knowledge. You know, academic, you can read about something and that not moves you at all. Like all of us could know that if we eat enough chocolate cake, we'll gain weight and it won't be good for us. We might get diabetes, but I like it anyway, so big deal. Uh, in other words, we don't connect the dots that we have an addiction. We become addicted to the material world. We become addicted to Maya. And breaking out of that addiction is not easy. If it, was, if it was easy, none of us would be here. Um, but I just wanted you, to, I just wanted you to, to see that there is a logic uh, to this. Any other questions? Well, we've covered a landscape, and I've exhausted everybody. But um, uh, I thank you for your participation. Oh, wait, I have one question. Okay, one. Oh, yes. Would you consider doing a workshop? With yeah, the of course. You know, so it would be not just a little lecture, a few days. Yeah, I'm. 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 You know, since I live here, it's not. Right. It's not a. It's not a great stretch. Just a matter of timing. You know, it's it's a matter of um, I I used to uh, give a talk in in my home once a month, and I used to give a talk somewhere else about once a week. You know, somewhere it was always uh, on the road and stuff. But I don't um, much um, any anymore. The thing is, here's what I've extracted as coming from a non-astrology world first. Why would I want to know this shit unless I could do something with it that was actually going to be productive? You know, it's like, unless I could translate it, and that has been my difficulty just for pre preparing a talk today, to be able to say something that was relatable. You know, I, you know, I can spin out all of the details that are factually correct but hooking those pieces of data to something that you can apply to your life and make something happen, that's, that's, quite, uh, that's quite a stretch. But I'm happy if you want me to, if you, ever, if you can talk to me about it, I'm happy to do that. That's, I mean, what, what the heck? We're all doing something here. Bob has put us here for a reason. Any other questions? Okay, well, namaste, Jay Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.